Baptist Church. Man, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with you today. I believe God has a word in store for us. One of the things I love about movement is that part of our journey uh, was what I'll call the Labby's living room, which is literally the Labby's living room. Anybody like remember what that was like, right? And so what we were praying for when we moved to a new location was that God would give us a bigger living room so that we could continue to see people come and hear this message. And there are a couple of lessons that I learned over our time together in the living room. The first thing is this, that people will show up 15 minutes late to a service like this, but they'll show up 30 minutes early to come to your house. Uh, and so the first couple of times that we had it, I was like, man, I got plenty of time, I'm good to go. And little did I know that y'all would show up 30 minutes early, and so I was scrambling to get everything done. So that was one of the lessons that I learned. I learned that in our time together that people don't care as much about your leaves as they care about your love. All y'all that came out know what that's like, right? Because every every time I was like get out there, and I'd be like mowing and like getting my lawn ready, and then God would have like this gust of wind come through to just like show my shame in front of all of y'all, right? And but what I learned is people don't really care about what the the outside looks like; they care about the love inside. And so that's part of the reason why when you walk in today, we wanted to meet regardless of what it looked like inside. Because we know regardless of whether or not there's paint on the walls, there's love where we show up to yeah. encourage one another. And so yeah. that's part of the reason why we're doing this. We're like, man, it's okay if it's a mess. Can I tell you that inside of me, there's a bit of a mess. And so if anything, it mirrors how I need Jesus to come in and change and transform me as well. Yeah. But the third and final thing that I learned is the beautiful collective body of Christ. I love that when we showed up, what it was not about is it was not about a cool show. It wasn't about whether or not we had great lighting. It wasn't about whether or not we had a great building. Like, it wasn't about any of those things. We showed up, and we loved one another. Yeah. And, and that's really what I believe the church is all about. As a matter of fact, what uh, what we call as a staff, this building is not Movement Church. We call this our HQ. We call it headquarters, right? Because the headquarters is where you come together for a brief period of time before you're sent out to go do what you're supposed yeah. to do. And so we don't call this the church. This is HQ, man. Y'all are the church. And so when we come together, one of the things that we know is with COVID, some of the struggle is that we don't get some of that connectivity that we had before. And so here's what we're doing is, is we're incorporating elements into our weekend experience so that we can collectively build one another up and disciple one another. So we're going to have people come up and pray. We're going to have people come and speak a word of scripture over us. Can I just say Jennifer pronouncing all of those words? Like, anybody else impressed? I was like, let's go. She's going to make me look bad. And so, you know, as we were walking through that, I was like, man, I love being encouraged by you. I love being able to be with you. And really, as we look at our church, we said, man, what would it look like for us to not only be collective and being able to do that, but there's 2,000 years of Christian church history. And so what you're going to notice is, is that we're going to do some things that maybe you're not familiar with. We're going to do something like a call and response where we read a part and you say a part. We're going to do things like creeds. We're going to start to do some of those things because there are 2,000 years of collective church history for us to encourage and build one another up in. And the reason why is because we believe the church is a place where we disciple one another. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's really what we're all about. And so yeah. every, every weekend, it's our goal that you would leave feeling and looking more like Jesus. And so we've been in this sermon series that we've been calling God of His Promise. And over God of His Promise, what we've realized is that God has made promises to us. Now, I don't know about you, but I was starting to think about different promises we make throughout our lives. And I was thinking about some of the promises that maybe uh, we, we interact with on a regular basis. So how many of us have ordered a Christmas gift in the mail this year? Okay, so a fair amount of us. How many of us have, like, gotten that Christmas gift in the mail already? Okay, so a good amount of us. How many of us, if the Christmas gift did not come in the mail and you were next year, 2021 Christmas, would call the company and be like, hey, where's my gift? <laughs> Nobody would. Okay, awesome. <laughs> I would. I would call them back. I'd be like, where's my gift? Why? Because there's a promise that when you order something online, it will show up on your doorstep, right? If we kept the order from Amazon and they never sent the package, we'd be like, what's going on? Why? Because there's a promise associated with that. When it comes to a license, what is a license? A license is a promise that you're not going to run over with people in your car, right? Like it's a promise that you're not going to like drive. No, you drove to church on the wrong side of the road today. Why? Because having a license. 
comes with a promise that you're going to be a, a reasonable citizen of America <laughs> and not be something dangerous with this crazy vehicle, right? And so early on in, in Holly and I's relationship, there were some promises that I didn't really hold up on. And one of them was this. So we grew up in two different types of households. She grew up in a household that uh, when you sit down to a meal at a restaurant, if it doesn't come the, the exact way you ordered it, then you have a conversation, right? Right. That was the family she grew up in. I, on the other hand, grew up in a conversation that, like, if they came with somebody else's meal, you just eat it. Like, you ordered fish, and they came with Brussels sprouts, you're like, this is what I'm doing today. Like, this is, this is what's happening, right? And so it would happen where over and over again, she would, like, ask me to flag down a waiter or waitress. And so time after time, I would fail in my promise to do that. And so finally, I'm like, I built up the courage to finally be like, babe, I'm going to flag down the waiter. And so I could feel myself, you know, I watched as the waiter got closer and closer, and I could feel the anxiety and the sweat, like, pouring down my body. And all of a sudden, I watched him just walk past. I don't say anything. I check it out in that moment. And Holly looks at me and, and says, I can never rely on you. <laughs> because not once, so I just couldn't bring myself to do that, right? But in the world, like, man, there are promises that we have that build the relationships we have with one another. It's the same thing in our relationship with God, that God has promises that he gives to us that we expect him to come through on. That's exactly what we're exploring during this time together, is this idea of God's promise. Because, here's the phrase that we're using, only when we understand the promise do we understand the promised one. Only when we understand the promise do we understand the promised one. And so we look at the Old Testament, and what happens, we begin to unpack the Old Testament, and we see these pictures of who Jesus was to be, these prophecies of this coming one, this Messiah, who would come and be able to redeem humanity. Now, as we begin this series, I've got to tell you, I've undergone a bit of a philosophical shift when it comes to preaching, uh, because oftentimes we come to church and we hear about stuff. Uh, I've listened to a couple of different pastors over the past week, and as I've kind of logged on, they've been telling stories about you, you know, yourself, and how you can grow, or how God's there for you, how God, you know, is going to make your life better. And, and so what we're doing is we're taking a bit of a shift during this time where we're talking about Savior over self. Yeah. And part of the reason why is because I believe that we really only understand ourselves when we understand our Savior. Yeah. There's this quote from C.S. Lewis, it's up on the screen, that says this, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Yeah. You see, it's only when we truly understand the Savior, it's only when we truly look at Jesus and who he was, that we can truly understand the world around us. And that's why during this Christmas season, we're taking time to explore who Jesus was and what he came to do. Yeah. Last week, we talked about how Jesus was the promised prophet. Today, we're going to talk about how Jesus is the promised king. That's the idea for us today. Really, starting the very first promise of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God looks at the serpent, right? He deceives Adam and Eve, and he says this. He says, he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying, listen, there's a coming one who, yes, you will strike, but ultimately you will be overcome by this promised one. And we know that promised one to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at what it looks like and what this promise was about this coming king, who would, who would reign over the people of God. 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verses 11 to 14. Uh, for those of you who have your Bible today, let's turn to Isaiah, though. We're going to camp out in Isaiah today. God's talking to King David. King David is the ruler, known as the greatest king over the nation of Israel. He kind of took Israel to a bunch of nomads to really be Israel that was an actual power at the time. And so he comes, and God promises David this promise. It says this, The Lord declares to you, the Lord will make a house for you when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors. So he's saying, listen, when you die, I will raise up after you your descendants who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. So what you see throughout the rest of the book of 2 Samuel and 1 Kings and 2 Kings is really this question mark of like, is it going to be this king? And so the king kind of would come for a little bit of time and it would be like, no, it's not that king. Yeah, people were like, okay, is it Solomon, like the guy who's wise? And what happens, what, Solomon uh, goes away from God? Is it Hezekiah? You know, that was, that was the thought at the time. Is it Hezekiah? And then Hezekiah comes and the end of his reign actually goes really poorly. And so we kind of wonder, we wait, we're wondering, where is this promised king? 
There's 800 years. And so all of a sudden, in uh, around 0 BC, we see the sun. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31, it says this uh, to, to Mary. Now listen, you'll conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus, and he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the what of his father? The throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And it's in that moment we see the fulfillment of the prophecy of a coming king made real in Jesus. And so today what I want to do is I want to convince you of two things. I want to convince you that Jesus is the coming king, and I want to talk about what kind of kingdom he will bring. So Jesus, the coming king, and what kind of kingdom he will bring. So Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah chapter uh, 9. Isaiah chapter 9. What's happened? This is 800 B.C., so a long time before Jesus. And there's this prophecy of this coming hope, this future king of the nation of Israel. And this coming king will establish a reign and will, will rule just and righteous before the people. And that's where we start with the promised king and what he will do. So Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 says this. The people walking in what? In darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. And so I love that idea of dawning. A couple of uh, days ago, I was watching the sunrise. And as I watched the sunrise, it was beautiful. There was incredible reds in the sky. And I looked, and man, it wasn't fully sunlight out, but you could tell that morning was coming. And I love that with Jesus, what happens is really this idea that, man, Jesus comes, and you can tell that there's darkness coming in the world, or, or light coming in the world, but the darkness not has yet continued. And so you begin to see that, man, Jesus has come, but there's still darkness to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And so in the midst of that, we see this idea of this prophecy of the kingdom of God. Now, what is a kingdom? A kingdom has three things. It has a people, has a place, and it has a proclamation, right? So it has the place where there's a rule and a reign. It has a people where they're ruling and reigning over. It has a proclamation of what you need to do to live into that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so what do you see with Jesus? So, so here's this crazy, this is crazy thing. So then it says this. For a child will be born for us, and a son will be given to us. In this, we have a description of a Messiah who is both human and divine. Because who is born but somebody who is human, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who is human is born. In order to be born, you've got to be human. But at the same time, if someone is given, that means that they are pre-existing mm -hmm. for all of eternity before this. And so what do you see? You see a Messiah that is promised that is both human and divine. And so who is Jesus? He is the human and divine king that is promised to come to restore his people to himself. Mm -hmm. And so you see that Jesus is this coming king. You know, I love that because I think sometimes we take this idea of Christmas for granted. But really, what does it point to? It points to the coming one who will rule in justice and righteousness. And we see that Jesus is that coming king. So the question is, okay, if Jesus is the king, then what is his kingdom like? A couple of things that his kingdom is not. Uh, first, his kingdom is not political. Uh, can I get an amen? Anybody get an amen, right? His kingdom is not political. Here's what we love to do. We love to put Jesus on our side of the political aisle. You know, we'll say like, well, this is what Jesus thinks about this topic. Or, you know, we like to form Jesus in our own image to say, you know, Jesus was a Republican for this reason, or Jesus was a Democrat for this reason. Can I tell you the kingdom of God is apolitical? It actually transcends politics. So when we look at our political understanding, we don't first look at what side of the aisle we fall on. We look at the king who we're following, and we recognize that it's not about this kingdom, but it's about his kingdom. Yeah. You see, because Jesus' kingdom is not political. Jesus' kingdom is not earthly. Yeah. And we thought that, man, we thought when Jesus showed up, he was going to, like, make it happen. Rome was going to be overthrown. We thought it was going to be this physical reign and ruling of God. But we see that actually the kingdom of God is not physical. So we see that the kingdom of God is not what we thought. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is entirely different. We're going to dive into what that looks like. But that, it's, it's not what you thought. You see, the kingdom of God is not about us. Crazy, right? Because we want to make it about us. We live in an us kind of society. What do we take? We take selfies, right? That's like a picture of our life. What are we doing our entire life? We're taking selfies of how we want a better life. 
The only thing is the kingdom of God is about the king, not about the people. Yeah. And so when we come to God, it's not about us and like, you know, looking and trying to say like, how do I get more money? Or how do I start the business I want to start? Or how do I live the life I want to live? No, the kingdom of God is about the king that we serve and the king that serves us. Yeah. And so we look and we begin to see this new kind of idea of the kingdom of God. And so three different ideas of the kingdom of God. The first one is this, it's up on the screen. The kingdom of God brings excellence in disposition. You can trust Jesus. Now, I know that some of y'all are like, what is disposition? What does excellence mean? Well, good news. I have definitions for you. So excellent, possessing outstanding quality or superior merit, and disposition is your character. And so here's what we see in our passage. It says this, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. So we look and we see a kind of rule and reign that is superior, a kind of rule and reign that is excellent in moral quality. You see, I think sometimes we get Jesus a little mixed up. We, we think that Jesus is actually way more like Santa Claus and less like Jesus. I was listening to, to a, uh, a, a little Christmas jingle uh, this past week, and, and as I was listening to it, I was like, man, this describes how people think about Jesus. So, so here it is. He's making a list. <laughs> He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and who's nice. <laughs> Jesus is coming to town, right? Is that everybody, right? <laughs> he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Right? That's a picture of Jesus. When he starts saying, man, Jesus is watching. Be a good person, right? Yeah. Jesus is going to come back and, like, we don't want, you know, you don't want to be doing the bad things. You're going to do the bad things. And, like, he's going to be not be happy. He's checking his list. And we start to think Jesus is so much like that. Can I tell you, Jesus is not like that. Yeah. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. Yeah. Jesus is a mighty God. Jesus is an everlasting father. Jesus yeah. is the prince of peace. I yeah. wish that our theology was way more informed by the Bible than informed by the Christmas carols that we sing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You see, what we need to understand is that as wonderful counselor, he knows the perfect thing to do in every moment. Yeah. You know that? That when we bring, whatever we bring before him, we believe that our God is sovereign. And so whatever we're walking through right now, God was wise to be able to choose that we would go through that because he is a sovereign God. Yeah. We understand that God is a mighty God. I love that because that means Jesus isn't up in heaven like, oh, shoot, you know, coronavirus happened. Wish, wish I could have stopped that. Like, man, whatever is happening in your life right now, sometimes I think we think God is up in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what in the world is happening. And the reason why is because we don't understand that Jesus is the mighty God. There is not a single thing that our God cannot do. I love that it says that Jesus is the eternal father. That, that when we get this idea of father, I love that picture. But some of us, I think, have a little bit of a twisted picture of what father looks like. Mm -hmm. You see, because father means that he's taking care of you. Well, when I think about our, our beautiful baby girl that's on the way, I think, man, my prayer is that she's not worried about taxes that year. <laughs> like, my prayer, she's not, like, when she's, like, growing up and she's, like, one years old, that she's not, like, coming to me being, like, Dad, what's happening when taxes come, right? Like, if she can speak at what well, that means that she's, like, Mensa smart, right? Like, she, she already is, I can tell. Um, you know, that's not going to happen. You know, I don't want her to come and be, like, you know, we're going to afford groceries. No, why? Because she knows that I'm a good father. In that same way, man, I love that when we come to this passage, what we see is that Jesus is excellent in disposition. He is the good father. I love that it says he is the prince of peace. Amen. And man, as we look at the Christmas season, I think sometimes what happens is we need to recognize that there are areas of our life where instead of peace, we have worry. Yeah. Instead of peace, we have anxiety. Instead of peace, we, we're wondering what's going to happen. And Jesus comes alongside and says, no, 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 listen, my kingdom is a place where I am the prince of peace. Yeah. He's saying, regardless of what's happening in your life, I want to tell you, this is what my kingdom looks like. Here's what's crazy about Jesus' kingdom. You know, I think sometimes we think Jesus' kingdom looks a certain way like us, but here's what Jesus' kingdom looks like. John chapter 13, it says, And knowing God had delivered all things into his hands, he took a towel, wrapped it around his waist, and washed the disciples' feet. You want to know what excellence and disposition looks like from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? It doesn't look like lording it over you. It doesn't look like saying you're not good enough. It doesn't look like saying, why don't you get your act together, and when you have your act together, then why don't you come to me? Our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his kingdom looks like a servant wrapping a towel around him and wiping the dirt off of your feet. Wow. I don't know about you today, but I want to serve that kind of king. When I think about our kind of king, I think about Jesus who says that he 
saw the crowds around him, and it didn't say that he was angry because like all these crowds came. No, it said, and he had compassion on them because our king has compassion on us. I love the ultimate display when Jesus says, you want to see me in my glory? And when you wonder what the glory of Jesus looks like, it is Jesus on a cross. Right, because two of his disciples say, "Can we sit with you in glory?" And Jesus says, "I know who's sitting on my right hand and my left hand when I am in glory." And we see the ultimate act and sacrifice of what the kingdom of God looks like is not Jesus on the throne, but Jesus on the cross. And that's the kind of king that we serve—one who is excellent in disposition. Can I tell you today that whatever you're going through, you can trust Him. Yeah. You can trust Him. So I think, man, what would it look like if we talk about? the way for the risen Lord, then what is it today that you're coming in with and you're wondering, can I really trust him? Yeah. Is he really a wonderful counselor? Is he really a mighty God? Is he really an everlasting father? Do you really trust that he and Jesus the entire time is saying, you can trust me? That's the kind of king we have. Mm. Excellence in disposition. The, the second thing that we see from this passage is this, that it is encompassing in dominion. Right? Like everyone, somebody say in like your preaching voice, dominion. dominion. Yeah, encompassing dominion, dominion. You can bring everything to Jesus. Verse 7, the dominion will be vast. Its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And I love that idea. You see, when Jesus steps on the scene, we actually see this dominion of the kingdom of God. You see, because when sin came into the world, we see brokenness. When Jesus came into the world, we see healing. What happens when Jesus steps on the scene? Jesus comes in and he begins to heal people. Why? Because healing and sick, because sickness is not a part of his kingdom. Healing is a part of his kingdom. When Jesus steps on the scene, he raises the dead to life because we see that he reigns over a kingdom of life, not a kingdom of death. When Jesus steps on the scene, we see that evil spirits flee because Jesus reigns over all of the kingdom. And I love that when Jesus steps on the scene, we begin to see a glimpse of what his kingdom looks like. Can I tell you today that there is no king that is above or beyond Jesus' dominion, that he's restoring all things unto himself. And here's what it says in Romans. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The picture of all of the Bible is fulfilled in that moment. You know that I love, man, as we talk about the picture of the Bible, we talk about the family of God. We talk about all the people of God gathered together to be able to praise the name of Jesus. That's the picture, that God's dominion is everywhere. I love that as we look across the world, that we see believers all over the place who are worshiping the same God and Father, Jesus Christ. I love this. I love that. Do you know that you have more in common with a young child in Africa with nothing, has no way to be able to get water? You have more in common with them than your neighbor across the street who doesn't know Jesus. Why? Because we serve the same everlasting Father. That's the picture. That's the picture of the Bible. Like, do you know how it ends? Is all of these ethnicities, all these tribes, all of these different types of people come together to worship God. You want another person who's most for racial reconciliation? It is Jesus. Because we see that that's the kind of kingdom that he has come to bring. Because his dominion is all-encompassing. You can bring whatever you want before Jesus. See, we talk about this idea of, of every knee bowing, every tongue confessing. It's this idea of us saying, man, Jesus has dominion over everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but there have been some things in my own life that I've had to entrust Jesus with. And to believe that he actually does have dominion and that I don't. You know, I love to think that I have control of things that I really have no control over. And so what is faith? Faith is this idea that you step out believing that God will catch you. Faith is not... Um, is not just like, yeah, I believe that this chair can hold me up and not sit in the chair. I love faith is this. Uh, how many of us have been skydiving? Anybody? Okay, not a single person. We need to take a church skydiving <laughs> trip. And, uh, and we'll all go together. It'll be awesome. We'll all experience it. Uh, but here's faith. Faith is being in the airplane and saying, I believe that this parachute can hold me up. And not sitting in the airplane, but actually jumping out. Why? Because what is going to hold you up in that moment? There's one thing that you're having faith in, that's the parachute. In the same way, what God calls us to do is to put all of our faith in him so that we have nothing else to hold us up but yeah. his own dominion and power. Yeah. You see, over the course of our lives, we've been able to experience a couple of things. And it's like every time that I think that I'm like reached the, the max of my faith, God's like, you haven't even started yet. <laughs> you see, we, we moved to a place where we knew no one. 
a number of times in our marriage, away from family. We, we moved to Georgia. We didn't know anybody. We moved to Chile. I'll never forget. We were sitting um, at our apartment and literally just started crying because we just moved away from our family to a place we knew nobody, like not a single person, not even a handful of like lovely faces, but I love so dearly. And like the way that God has brought you in our life. And like, that was a step of faith. But for us, we look at times in our life where we're like, are we going to give to God? Or are we going to like look at the amount of bills that are coming in? And in that moment, it was like, am I going to be faithful to continue to give? Or, or am I going to take a step back? As we look at launching it and being able to come into this building, man, that's a step of faith for us to say, man, we believe that God is going to show up. And every single time, God has shown up. But can I tell you, every time before I take the step, there are a lot of sleepless nights. Yeah. I know that you think that like maybe I just like we woke up one day and we're like, what if we get a building? That's probably a good idea. We, we got nothing. We are cash rich. You know, like we have nothing but cash. And so like, let's go get a building. And we just like walked in. And we we're like, here it is. You know, like I think that's sometimes what happens. But can I tell you, man, there was a lot of prayer. There's a lot of sleepless nights. There were a lot of moments where we're like, God, you're going to come through on this thing because I don't know how it's going to work. But in those moments, can I tell you, God shows up every single time because his dominion is always practicing. And what is it today? that you have not yet given to him because you don't yet trust him. What is that maybe you've held back? I love that Jesus says this, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, rest only comes when we release control to the one who actually can do something about it. That's why Jesus can say, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got so much to worry about itself. Just focus on today. Because I'm, I'm in today. I'm in this moment. Just release it to me. I've got you. What is it today that you need to give to Jesus? Prepare the way for the Lord in your life. So there's a couple of things that, that we want to do. We want to recognize that God is com encompassing in dominion. The last one is this. As we look at the kingdom of God, this is what the kingdom of God brings. It's eternal in duration. That you can experience eternity now. Here's our passage. It says this. To establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and when? Forever. Forever. From, from now on and forever. That means from this moment that eternity doesn't, like I think that as Christians, sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, like then when I go to be with God and like we're playing harps up in the cloud, like then it will be good. But like for now, and it's like Jesus is like, no, that's not how it works from now on until forever. You see, there's this idea that, man, life with Jesus starts now. Eternity starts now. I don't know if you've ever had one of those days that you can relive a hundred times. Anybody just like think in your own mind, like what's the day that you can relive? I, I get this picture in my mind. So we were in LA uh, last year and we were at, at Venice Beach and we got this Airbnb. And literally, uh, we, we rolled up at night and Venice Beach at night is super safe. Like, I was like, for sure, I'm going to die. Like, this is the end. I'm ready to go on to eternity. Like, we'll see what happens. And so, uh, but we wake up the next morning and literally we walk out and the beach is right there. And so we lay on the beach, and it's like California, right? So it's like, you know, this perfect, like, sunshine and cool breeze all at the same time. We, like, got up, and there were vendors on the street, and there were people, like, giving us pineapples. And it was an incredible – if I could relive that moment 100 days, I would totally do it. Yeah. Man, to live with Jesus is to live the best day every single day, mm -hmm. to live with joy and peace, to live with goodness and life, to live with gentleness. To understand that eternity is not something we have to wait for, but eternity can start right now when we are with the very Lord and Savior, the King of all our kingdom. Mm -hmm. so here's what it says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. You can experience eternity now. So at the beginning of this service, we, we gave this passage of uh, it says this from Isaiah. It says, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight. The rough ways smooth. And everyone will see the salvation of the Lord. As we look at that reality, what, what I want to encourage you with as we kind of have a moment, the band's going to come up, and we're going to play for a second. But here's what I'd love for you to do. When you came in, there's a, a card, a connect card on your seat. What I would love for you to do is, we as a staff, we love to pray with you, especially during this season. And so what we're going to have you do is, we, as we play for about a minute, is we would love for you to reflect right now, what is something that God is calling you to trust him with during this season? What is something God is, is calling you to give him during this season? 
And we would love for you to go ahead and write that down on the back of that card. And, and, and what we're going to do is if you just want to go ahead, you can write your name on it, or if you want it to be anonymous, you can go ahead and leave it anonymous. But we're going to take a moment because, again, we don't want you to take the Christmas season, and I don't know about you, but the older that I get, and I'm not even like that old yet, so I'm the older that I get, you know. Uh, but the older that I get, the more Christmas just becomes like another thing. Like it's just Christmas and it's less exciting than it was 10 years ago. You know, it's less exciting every year. We live this moment. But I think it's in these moments that Jesus is saying, listen, don't allow Christmas, the greatest miracle that the world has ever seen, don't allow it to become like normal or mundane. But allow these moments to be able to be a place where Jesus is a straight path to us. That, that's what would happen as kings. They would actually have kings and they would have a herald that would go before the king, right? Hark the herald angel. See, we were joking earlier that, like, I was even thinking, I didn't know which angels named heralds, right? The herald angels, and, like, all the heralds were, like, singing it out, and all the rest, like, nobody else was, right? Like, what are the herald angels? Like, they were the angels that would go before, and they would they would cry that, that, that the king was coming. And what would happen is they would make the path straight so the king had a straight shot. They would take all the trees out. They would level the places that weren't leveled out. And, and in, in this season, we have an opportunity to say, make so we're going to take a moment, and maybe there's something today that you need to understand that, man, God's got you. You can trust him. Like, he expects what he needs to do. Maybe there's something that you need to know that he is, he is encompassing your individually, that whatever it is that you gave to him, that he's helped with. Maybe today you need to know that he is, he is so good, and that his eternal deserves you, and that eternal life is upside down. Here's what I'd love for you to do. Go ahead and close your eyes. I'd love to pray for you. Today, maybe you haven't made that decision for Jesus. And if you haven't made that decision for Jesus, this idea that you can have a, a full relationship with, with him now and for all eternity, I would love for, for you to just allow Jesus to be, uh, be your Lord and Savior of your life. Really what that means to believe in him and to commit to follow him all the days of your life. Because eternity with him starts now and it, start, and it goes on for forever. And really what, what we do is we just pray a simple prayer where you say, Jesus, I trust you with today and the rest of me. And I commit to follow you all the days of my life. And it's in that heart disposition of trusting in who he is that we actually get to experience